welcome everybody. Thank you so much for coming to this uh, session. Um, it's going to be, be myself and Nancy from um, Freedom House, who I think most of you know by now. Uh, this is really such a wide uh, subject, although we are focusing on one country, but it touches on issues that affect the whole Arab region and affect struggles across the whole Arab region and affect our work in multifarious ways. Um, what I'm going to do is just like whiz through quickly um, some thoughts on how we got to where we are today and um, then I'm going to give the floor a little bit to Nancy who's going to then set the tone um, and then we're going to open up the discussion. Um, we know that the, uh, what happened in 2011 took the world by surprise. People were not prepared for it. And um, at the time, the arguments, of course, that people were using was we have a very belligerent government in place and how on earth, you know, um, how on earth are people ever going to be able to move this, uh, advance this forward in the place of such a belligerent authoritarian government. Um, the background that we had prior to the revolution, we can think about how much of this is actually still relevant now and how much of this has actually changed. Um, we had the incredible um, speed with which inflation was rising, high unemployment, rising food prices, um, highly corrupt political class. Um, we had the emergency law in place, which Mubarak had put in place um, uh, almost immediately that he, uh, he came into power. We had a very limited space for civil society to operate, high level of political apathy. Maybe that's changed now, but I'd probably venture to say much of those criteria are still, still in place. Oh, pardon me. Oh. I've actually, I'm not stupid, but I'm visually a bit disabled, <laughs> so it does take you a bit of time. <laughs> um, yeah, so, <laughs> and there was, and I think it's important to recognise, um, as lots of uh, the presenters have touched on, that many of these things did not emerge from nowhere, there was a sustained build-up to this. And um, people have made reference to the Café movement uh, in the early 2000s, 2003 to 2006, the April 6 youth movement, um, even al Baradai's campaign for reform in 2010, and of course the We Are All Khalid Said campaign in the winter of 2010, which was a really what people credit as being the um, most recent campaign that started to gather the momentum for the revolution. Um, so one of the things I think is, is very relevant is how were large numbers mobilised, how did activists innovate and replan, how did the movement build solidarity. We've, met, we've seen, so I'm not going to go into detail because we've seen how um, Hardy and Mache and others have talked about how um, uh, movements are organised and how people are mobilised. Uh, we know about how technology was used. Um, we know, we've seen how uh, the global uh, agenda or the global interdependence and um, using global and external actors to further your cause. Um, and well, one of the things I think was quite distinctive was this total insistence on non-violence and they did succeed in uh, achieving almost total withdrawal of cooperation. They were strategic about the choice of, uh, of date because it was National Police Day in Egypt so that was also a very uh, strategic wasn't coincidence, and I think that they had no, uh, really no uh, idea that they were going to be able, even at that particular point in time, um, there's this quotation from one of the organisers, Sherdi Harb, who said, um, we were 100,000 people in Galette Square, and we thought thousands coming from Giza, and at that point we realised it was the end of the regime. And there's this very famous photo that I think you're all familiar with. Um, I think, yes, it's important to say that we know Facebook has been mentioned a lot, but we, I think, and I've said this before, that to say it was Facebook revolution is really to discredit a lot from 
the um, innovative aspect and from the ingenuity of, um, of the activists. And they did use the internet to organize, that's true. They used a lot of dilemma actions. They were quite um, clever when the when Mubarak's uh, government started to shut down the internet, people took to the streets. Um, and there was an amazing, amazing, overwhelming show of unity. Um, people used humor. Um, they organized, self-organized themselves into neighborhood watch groups. Yes, this, um, subsequently what then uh, was running up at the time was the, something called the Hawar Watani, the National Dialogue, which was supposed to be a process for reform. And uh, again, there were a lot of thwarted hopes there. A lot of people were very disappointed. So there were certain lessons that these um, activists learned and benefited from the experience of, uh, of others, um, not just from Tunisia but elsewhere. Um, they began rallies and demonstrations in the outskirts, they started in some of the working class districts and not in some of the districts where one would have thought police focus would be. They had started running test runs already in 2010 um, and they had been preparing, they had been slowly gathering and preparing themselves for some time. Uh, something that people might also know is that they had made contact with some of the football clubs, such as El Ahli, who had really valuable advice on how to deal with police violence. We talked uh, the very first day about um, Otpoor and the fact that they had been giving some advice and support to Egyptians, but also there had been some expat Egyptians based in Qatar who had founded something called the Academy of Change and who trained some of these Egyptian activists who were later then on the front lines. So there are 10 groups who made up the Youth Coalition for the Egyptian Revolution, and they were joined by whatever their name, who's become kind of a household name um, in Egypt, who'd worked with the 6th of April movement, and um, Hamad al-Baradai, and used his marketing um, expertise to set up the We Are All Khalid Said group, which became just one of the things around which people mobilized. Um, and I think around the time of the revolution, other things came to the fore, such as the bombing of the church, um, this was very significant because the government was trying to profile or trying to build up that there was a, an anti-Christian um, sentiment in Egypt and then it later actually emerged that the bombing of the church had been uh, ordered by the Minister, well, the Minister of the Interior. So this is where I think the discussion becomes really interesting in terms of where do we go from here? We saw that actually in the months um, immediately following the fall of Mubarak, we had the military council that was clamping down in a very autocratic way um, with uh, mass arrests of bloggers and activists and um, statistics that shocked a lot of people, including the fact that there are now more civilians under arrest awaiting military trial than during the entire Mubarak regime, which is quite a sobering figure. The military uh, has more control, or appears to have more control over state media than ever before. And even prominent personalities like, for example, Bethania Kemen, who some of you might know, who um, was in the Shafin Qom Egyptians Against Corruption movement. She was a presidential candidate, and she also had her own TV show. She had really quite a following. And um, even there, she's been constantly intimidated. She, one day she has work, the next week she doesn't have work they've been able to take her off, uh, off the air and then allow her to go back on the air at random um, as they see fit. So we see that even quite prominent celebrities um, no longer seem to enjoy perhaps the kind of protection that they may have had, had in the past. So I think now the, the key question, I've tried to summarize um, some of these issues in the abstract and um, Nancy is going to give you her own very particular unique experience which I think the experience of a lot of people unfortunately who have um, seen now the, the new face of the, of the new enemy. Um, I think now we need to think about, or activists as a whole need to think about what kind of tactics do we need to deploy now in the face of this new challenge that we have and with the new enemy um, that we have. And it's clear that Mubarak has gone, 
but there's still a lot of the old guard uh, in place. Um, it's very difficult for a newer generation of, of administrators to enter and to actually start making headway uh, progress. We've seen, in fact, that the um, NGO law, Law 84, which was um, the, the law that actually governs civil society activity in Egypt, has actually been sharpened now. In contrary to the fact that uh, this much hated law, people had uh, hopes that um, after Mubarak, this law would be done away with, repealed altogether, new legislation set up, and in fact, it's just become more repressive. Um, I'd just like to hand over to Nancy now, um, who will tell you a little bit about her experience. Um, Nancy uh, was uh, heading programs at Freedom House in Egypt. And for those of you who are perhaps are not familiar with the context, um, Freedom House was one, was one of several NGOs that the government had clamped down on. And um, most recently, at the beginning of June, had sentenced several people to arrest in, uh, in absentia. And some of these NGOs also German NGOs representing the German political foundations that had been operating in Cairo for decades um, and had, you know, enjoyed a relative freedom to operate. So this is a new environment now um, that we are that we are facing and um, an enemy where people are not familiar in terms of how do I deal with this. Um, we had an experience uh, personally in my work in 2008 where we had organized a workshop uh, on transparency related issues and we received a call the night before the workshop from the hotel saying that the uh, hotel staff had received a call from state security saying that our workshop could no longer go ahead because we had just booked it in the Transparency International name and we were not working via an Egyptian NGO. But we were able to track down who the person was at state security and uh, negotiate with them. It didn't enable us to hold our workshop there, we had to hold it elsewhere, but then at least we were able to understand uh, a little bit where they were coming from. I think now it would be very difficult to find an interlocutor at state security that one could have a discussion with uh, uh, at a civil, civil level. So I'm going to hand over to Nancy now, who's going to talk to you a little bit about her experience. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you so much, Arla, and thank you for having me here. I don't know if you can hear me in the back. No. Maybe I can use this. All right, um, I came here under the impression that uh, I'm, I'm just going to talk about the political situation in Egypt and uh, what's going on, uh, but Arwa said that I'm more interested to hear about the personal story, the journey, which I think Egypt is less complicated than that. <laughs> it's, just, it's more difficult to talk about this uh, journey, but I think I, I will try to um, interwine both the personal and the political and the professional and how actually when you're going through a period when your country is undergoing a whole lot of changes, difficult changes, um, the person and the professional and the political becomes blurred and uh, it's very difficult to separate them. Uh, the story has been, uh, uh, hopefully, Egypt's story would be less tragic than, uh, than mine, well, which uh, had a, a very unhappy ending. It's not the end yet, but in June 4th, I was sentenced to five years in prison in absentia. Uh, the next day, the former head of the state security under the Mubarak regime and 40 police officers got an acquittal. They were found innocent, while we, the defenders of the people who were tortured, we were found guilty. So it was kind of a very stark um, contrast, uh, the kind of message that the government or the people in power are trying to give the people. If you, yeah. Who were found guilty of what? Uh, that's the story, <laughs> I'll tell you. I mean, the technical charge is uh, uh, Operating an office without a license and receiving funding from foreign government without permission from the government. But just yesterday, I received the the, the full justification of the of the court's decision. It's 125 pages, talking about how you were conspiring against the Egyptian 
uh, um, state, not just a particular regime, and we wanted to bring the country down, and we were implementing a Zionist agenda, and we were working to for, this, for the benefits and interests of Israel and the West, and that we are what we call in, in Arabic is that we actually wrote this, that we are a Asaba, which means we're a, we're a gang, uh, that we're just working against the interest of Egypt and the people, and a, a more of a mafia, and that, thank God, that with the will of the Egyptians, they were able to expose us, and they would just, this was, I mean, like, and it, it goes on and on for 125 pages, like, we were portrayed as the devil, I mean, it was like, I wish it was that powerful, but it was just, uh, this, this is how it was like, but I mean, like, it, it is even worse when it was portrayed in the media. So, I think my aim, and, and I, I will try to be brief in, in the story, and um, but just to make the link between what happens on on this level and how how and why the aspirations of the Egyptian people who went to took to the streets hoping for a change went in, in, and turned out to be that way, and why. I hear something today, and with all the things that I went through, I don't have a single shred of regret or or reminiscing of, of the time of the Mubarak regime. But I hear it all the time. And I think one of the reasons that maybe it's, it's a fault on our part that we fail to show people the relationship between their poverty and misery and, and the need to, to create this change. It gets caught up in the way in the procedural democracy issues about like having the constitution, the parliament, the presidential elections and people just lose the, the sight of the bigger picture. It's like, how is this going to help me take my kids and be safe, make sure that they are safe when they go to school. How am I going to put bread on their table? And that's precisely where where the connection of my story and where, where I found this path through it. So I I started my career working in the World Bank. I was working on poverty alleviation projects in, in the slum and the south of Egypt. It was like one of the poorest areas in the country. And I thought that this is the way to go about um, uh, correcting or, or, or altering the whole mechanisms of injustice in the country, the economic injustice and the inequality. But soon after I worked there for a while, I realized that the issue is not about the lack of funding or the lack of foreign funding. It's the lack of accountability mechanisms. It's the lack of the ability of people to be in power, to hold the governors and hold the people who, who have power over the money, to hold them accountable and it's the lack of the rule of law and the culture of impunity. So I think that was the time when I thought that I, I need to just shift the, the, my focus. And I had this very naive idea. I was young, I was just, just graduated, and just after a couple or three years, I said, it's like, well, the solution is to actually join the Egyptian government and reform it from within. Okay, so um, I'm, I'm, I'm happy that, uh, that you politely did not laugh at that, but uh, I was under that impression and because my work was, was in foreign aid, I was actually working at the Egyptian government at the Ministry of International Cooperation as the evaluator of the impact of foreign aid in Egypt. Ironically, with Minister Faiza Abu Naga, who is now standing on the other side of the law with me, like she's actually the one who put me in prison. So uh, at that time, I, uh, we were a group of young uh, Egyptians, like we were very enthusiastic about doing this work. Uh, but again, uh, very soon after joining this unit and working within the government, we realized that it, the, the issue is more, it's, it's even bigger than a few individual changing something. It's, there's a need to change the, the system, the, the whole authoritarian approach to governance. And this is this was the time. This was the year when Saadeddin Ibrahim got out of prison. He was the um, the chairman of Ibn Khaldun Center that was closed down by the Egyptian authority three years before that. And when he got out, I met him and I said, "I just want to work with you." And he says, "Like, why would you want to do that to yourself? I mean, you just got you, you've got a like a master's degree, you have a job, and everything." I said, "Like, I can't keep on living in, in, in these conditions." So I worked with Saad, and he was an incredible mentor and supporter, but at that time, he's, he's the one who told me that if 
freedom has a price and some people have to pay that price. And if you're willing to pay that price, maybe change will happen. And, and at that time when, we, when people used to ask me, it's like, well, what kind of job do you have? And I say, we're working on democracy and human rights is like democracy under Mubarak and they would laugh at us and say, this is never going to happen. So, and we were used to the state security intimidations, the midnight phone calls, the flat tire in the morning, all, all these things. I mean, like, but it was kind of mild. And uh, I, I left Egypt in 2005 uh, when I, I kind of, it wasn't a weak moment, but a moment when I, when I realized that there's very little change that can happen when Gamal Mubarak was received at the White House or, or, or formally in Egypt, it's like as the, it, it became accepted that he is the coming um, heir to the, to the president. Um, and I, I went to the UK to do my PhD on the power relations of foreign aid because then I was again still passionate about understanding was like how can we um, improve the lives of people uh, living there and uh, finished my PhD there, stayed there, was working and in January 2011 the revolution happened and I was like it was a moment that was like I was just could not wait to go back to Egypt and uh, I got the opportunity where um, uh, Freedom House announced that they are opening an office in Egypt and they would, they would like someone to, to be the uh, country director for, for the office. I applied for the job. I immediately moved my life, took my, my two little twins back and we went on a plane down to Egypt. But the time I, I arrived to Egypt in August 2011, the uh, Supreme Council of Armed Forces were, or the military was the ones who were ruling the country at that time. And I think they were in a position that they really, it was not just that they were authoritarian in their way, but they did not have the, the, the means and the competence of ruling people face to face. That they, they, they used to govern before, but not rule. I mean, like they were not the ones who are actually in the upfront. And I used to laugh when people told me that just like, don't worry, it's a transitional period, and the, the, the military will go back to their barracks. And I said, like, but they were never were in their barracks. I mean, they used to be in the most strategic and most important positions in the country. The military men were, were, were the governors of the most important governorates in Egypt. They were in the most strategic ministries in, uh, in, in the cabinet. And they were the heads and managers of the most strategic and important industrial projects in Egypt. So they were really the ones in control. It was not. It was a myth when people thought uh, that the military were not in control before, and now they are, and they're going to go back to their barracks. So that was one of the things that, like, we, we were trying to to demystify or mystify. The military actually owned a lot of businesses as they, well. It's forty percent of the Egyptian economy. So, so that was one of the things. The other thing that was problematic at that time and that we saw is that there were two things happening at the same time in Egypt. There was the people's movement, the, the, the people's aspiration for democracy and, and the ideal of democracy. And on the, on the other hand, there was the procedural democracy where like, the military had those old check boxes that we have to get the constitution, we have to get the, the parliament, and we have to get the, uh, the presidential elections, and everyone thought is like once we have a president, things will stabilize. Once the military goes away, things will stabilize. But I think the people who had this thought in mind did not understand that the issue of Egypt was not about a particular ruler. It's about the rules of the game more than the rule. I mean, like the idea of having a rule of law where people understand that there is, they have a channel to claim their rights other than the impunity and the favoritism or the, 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 the oppression as well. So so this is why before, after Mubarak stepped down, we saw a lot of incidents of sectarian rifts, like burning of churches and we've seen some killings and, and violence against minorities. But the thing is, it's not like the Christians were living under, in a, on, under heaven when they were under Mubarak. But what happened is that right after the police oppression was kind of like, not lifted, but it, was, it became more chaotic. People found that they can do something and get away with it because with the first attack against a church, for example, in Egypt, it was not solved by the rule of law. Not a single person was indicted in any of the all, all the incidents that were done against the, the churches in Egypt. 
And that goes on and on and on for all the aspects, I mean, like the, all the, the, the theft and, and everything. They would have, for example, a community council, people sit together and reconciliate and have some like uh, rhetorical talk, but no rule of law, no consequences to what, what, whatever, whoever commits something and violates the rights of, of others. And that's the problem. And this brings me to the point of um, stepping a bit away from the from the personal i think there were two myths at the time of uh, of the of, of the revolution that later on people started to understand the first myth was the myth of the, the brotherhood that, that the brotherhood was a very very organized and successful organization that everyone thought that when they were successful as an underground group and doing a lot of charity work organizing very well mobilizing and having everything tied together, but serving like we're talking about five million people, that when they come to power, to a bigger scale of 90 million people, they can do the same, they can apply that and just blow it out like to a bigger, larger picture and succeed. And of course, that was the first myth that we saw that is like ruling a country is not like ruling a, a certain group under an underground. And the same thing actually with the liberals, the seculars, and that's the, that's the second mistake or the second myth. What everyone thought is like the liberals in Egypt is going to be like the first 18 days in, in Tahrir Square where the Muslims are praying and the Christians are, are protecting them, where the woman would pass in the street and no one would sexually harass her. And everyone is nice and sweet and lovely. But th th these were 18 days where people were not competing uh, over resources. There was no, I mean, there was an external enemy that people wanted to bring down. People knew what they do not want, but they did not know what they want. And that's the main issue about Egypt, and that's the main issue about the different opposition groups in the country. What we, what the, the groups that were very clear about what they're doing is the human rights and democracy activists and, and the human rights and democracy groups. And this is what, this is, this was actually our role. And that's why we were seen as very dangerous because we were trying to educate people about their civic rights, about strategies, about how to monitor elections, about how, how to select a candidate on, 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 and on what basis. And, but the, by the time I arrived to Egypt, there was a huge smear campaign against foreign funding. And it was a systematic um, approach. And it was a state-controlled media still. I mean, yes, new outlets were opening up, but not to the extent that it turns it into a real free, free media environment. And the, the, the way they systematically criminalized our work is that they started by using words as like those who are involved in foreign funding for NGOs. And then a month later, it changed into those who are implicated in the work of NGOs. And finally, it became the suspects who work with NGOs. So it's like the systemic, systemic criminalization of the work of foreign aid and, and becoming a stigma f for that. The one mistake that we did is that we were trying to uh, bend for the wave. I mean, like the, the, the advice coming to us from abroad is like, keep a low profile until the, the elections will pass. It's a transition, everyone is not really ready for that, but I think that's, that is an advice that is valid, but not in every time, not at a time like that, because our local partners were having a different advice. They were saying, it's just like, speak loudly, say, I mean, at that time, I was personally under attack. I was getting a, a, a phone call of threat every night at 1 a.m. and 5 a.m., every night, every single night from state security, just to make sure I don't sleep, just to, like, the whole process of intimidation went even further than that to an extent that I was worried for my kids and, and everything. But then and then we, we, we again got the assurances like, don't worry, it's like no one knows who's doing what, no one knows even what the state security loyalty is for, just be patient and be there. And I think my lawyer was, uh, uh, he's, a, he's a very experienced human rights lawyer, uh, gave me an advice and I think I, I wish we, we listened to him at the end. So like he said, Nancy, if the government decides to hit you, they're going to hit you if either you're high or you're low. But if they hit you when you're high, the cost is higher for them. So I mean, like it's better to stay on uh, on on the radar screen. Don't don't lay low. But I mean, like it was. It, this is something that has never happened before. And I remember, I mean, like even with the meeting with the American ambassador in uh, in Cairo, and she was telling me, like Nancy, they would never raid an American organization, and they would never do that. I mean, a few days later, on the 29th of December, 
they went with machine guns into our offices, 11 offices at the same time, at the zero of our, it's as if they are just attacking a network of drug smuggling or something. They held our staff in communicado for six hours. They made them submit their passwords for their computer, for their, for their email accounts, and uh, they sealed the, the office with, with red wax. And after that, I mean, this still carried on with the intimidation. I mean, every time I went to, to the interrogation, the one thing that the prosecutor made sure, I mean, like he held me for interrogation the first day for seven straight hours. No one knew where I was, I mean, or, or what they were doing. But the one thing he kept on insisting on making sure is that I don't tell a single soul that I'm being interrogated. And that worked very well because none of us, all the 43 at the beginning, knew that we were going under this. So they were able to just expand their, their plan. And this is one of their, their tactics. I mean, we kind of knew, but later on in, in, the, in the process, and even he used to threaten me, he's like, I read your tweets. I mean, if, you, if you tweet one more time again that you're coming here, you're going to be put in jail. So, I mean, like, this, this was the story. We stayed on, on trial for a year and a half, and that throughout this year and a half, the main purpose was not, we were not the target. I think the target was the actually the local civil society organization, is that to, to first of all, cut the resources and the support to them, cut it to the knowledge transfers that, that we provide with them, and also have this picture of us behind bars as a, to create a chilling effect. It's like, if this is the, the kind of path that you're going to have, this is where you're going to end up being. And I, I remember the first time I went into the cage, the number of cameras, and, and it's like the moment I went into the cage, I knew this is for public consumption. This is not a real trial, this is a show trial. The judge was not even there, I mean, and it was extremely chaotic, it was like a circus, but the whole, the most important thing they focused on is just taking that picture. And every day, keeping up pictures in the press, in, in every single um, uh, newspaper in Egypt, just to say, I mean, like, how we were plotting against the country, and how they were, like, we're, we're Zionists, and, and all these things. Unfortunately, people thought that it's going to die in, in, along the way, because there is a pressure, because there are Americans and foreigners in the case, um, but the fact that there are also, even if the United States and Germany and the, the countries that are involved in the issue do care for human rights and democracy, but we cannot undermine the needs for other strategic goals of security. I mean, like, so there is always like, yeah, I mean, like, we can do this, but remember, we have a peace treaty with Israel, and the Muslim Brotherhood can breach that. And it's like, weighing that you want to cut off military aid? It's like, think about the consequences. I mean, like, having people like that. So it's like, um, I think one of the things, or, or I'll probably stop here and maybe opening it for more questions and we'll have a more as a conversation, is that when organizations work together, I mean, the, they are stronger. I mean, like, the international solidarity is actually one of the things that helped us, I mean, it could have been gone worse. Actually, when we went to the cage the first time, the people were chanting for our execution. So the fact that we ended up with a five years prison is actually a, a kind of a, a lesser of, of, the, of, the, of the two evils. Well, today, actually, this morning, I learned that the, the prosecutor filed an appeal again that they want to take the case further and have a, a, a harsher sentence because they see that the sentence is not good enough, so so that's it. <laughs> so, sorry, it's not a happy story, but... <laughs> um, yeah, first of all, I think, um, thank you so much to Nancy for so uh, bravely uh, sharing her story, and uh, I'm sure it's not difficult, not easy for her because she has to relive those incidences again as she recalls them, as she brings them to mind in order to uh, share with us, and I think she did a brilliant job of structuring um, the whole build up. Um, to put it into context, uh, the charges that were levied against um, uh, not just Freedom House but the other uh, NGO workers were, ba were based on allegation they used foreign funds without permission and that is actually one of the uh, clauses within Law 84 and I mean um, as we mentioned Law 84 is a very uh, repressive 
of law, but at the same time, there have been periods, later periods of quiet, where that law was pretty much, you know, in the drawer for years, and the Egyptian government had been allowing people to operate. So at random times, they were raising the level of repression and just picking out what suited them from the law uh, in order to have a tool with which to clamp down uh, on activists with. So um, this is what we are, we are up against, and I think um, this is a very, very difficult um, scenario. Even one of the NGOs um, was the, that was clapped down on was the Konrad Adenauer Foundation, which is the political foundation of the German Christian Democrats that had actually had a very good relationship with the Mubarak regime for like the last 35 years. So um, this is a new, new scenario that we're dealing with. And uh, we're going to open the floor up to all of you, and um, perhaps we can brainstorm together on uh, on how how we think uh, one can move forward in this. Thank you. So um, yeah, so we have uh, a lot of hands going up here. Uh, Abdalia, um, Natalia, Steve, uh, Ben. Ben. Okay. Um, yeah. Annie. Annie. Okay, uh, Daniel, would you like to... Um, I remember doing the, uh, when the first charges were first filed... A little bit louder, please. Oh, sorry. I remember when the charges were first filed against the NGOs, all of the Islamist NGOs weren't, didn't face anything like this, even though they also received funding mainly from the states of Qatar, Kuwait, and Saudi Arabia. Yeah. And that just went under the radar. And this was under the military regime at the time. And now Egypt is under the Muslim Brotherhood. So has it, is it continuing? Is it still the same where non islamist NGOs are still facing problems, are still facing harassment? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, the, no one, I mean, the Muslim Brotherhood as, a, as an organization is Brotherhood organization, I mean, like for a long time, I mean, has been an illegal organization. They have been operating, no one came near to them, no one told them what they're doing, where your money's coming from. And we have like a series, like a chain of Salafis, also Salafi uh, organization that is in every corner in Egypt. No one knows. The, the, or the Salafis are the more conservative side of like the, the Islamists uh, in, in, in Egypt. So, um, so uh, they get loads of money. Everyone knows that, but they were not uh, under attack. Or, like, and and also, it's not just the the, Islam, the Islamists only, but there are other develop, international development organizations working in Egypt without a license, but no one came near to them. There was a target. It was democracy and human rights organization. That's that was the clear message. Yeah, I'm just thinking, might, maybe we'll take a few questions. Yes, okay, time. sure. So I have here um, Steve, um, Talia, Ben, um, Annie. 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 Uh, okay, so Steve. Um, yeah, I just say in addition to the double standard, obviously, between uh, Western secular and uh, Gulf, mainly Gulf based Islamist. Uh, you know, um, NGO funding, you have the phenomenon that the very government that is acting so haughty and nationalistic about foreign funding still gets $1.5 billion from the U.S. government. Right. Um, and I'm just wondering, how, how are they getting away with it? I mean, what, I, mean, get, I, mean I mean, I mean... I think they're, they're getting away with it in the same way Mubarak was getting away with it. Yeah, oh, yeah. I mean, like, yeah. was the, well, basically, is two things. The politics of distraction and the double speak. Mm -hmm. So, internally, the message is always that we very George Orwellian way. It was like we want to protect ourselves from the outside enemy, and the outside enemy is the West, and like they're creating this whole xenophobia there. But at the same time, the message abroad and and the and the representatives of the Muslim Brotherhood, I see them in D.C. every week, like talking that they are friends with the U.S. and they would love to continue <laughs> relationship and they love Israel and and everything is like. And even there was this scandal about the, uh, I don't know if you know the story, after the whole ordeal of the, f the film, the anti-Muslim film, and there were attacks against uh, the embassies. There was an attack of, uh, on the American embassy in, in Cairo, and the, the Ikhwan web, which is the Muslim Brotherhood web, tweeted in English saying, we stay in solidarity with you and everything. And in, in Arabic, they wrote that, 
we have to defend Islam and things like that. So the American embassy responded saying, thank you so much for this embassy, but we understand Arabic too. <laughs> and, it was, and it was very telling, but this was not just that, that joke. It was like, this is the approach what they do, the message that goes abroad and the message inside. And when they talk about the military uh, aid, they also boldly sometimes says like if they want to take aid, they they can yeah. take it. We don't need that. But and also Steve, I mean just um, the fact is that these things don't follow a logic. Mm -hmm. Really, they don't follow logic, and um, I think more in terms of public opinion. I mean, well, I've had the, the anti-regime people that are able to. I think the, the problem is, I think the problem is, is that there's a very large slice of public opinion that doesn't have the level of education. When we're really talking about, you know, you're talking about 90 million people. Yeah. You're talking about a quite high level of illiteracy. You're talking about large um, slice of the population that gets their um, information mainly from state TV. Um, not everybody is reading the newspapers. Very few people are, you know, um, listening and watching, reading foreign media. So um, they're able to get away with it to an extent. And I think um, what we're seeing now is that a lot of the voices that were seem to be very outspoken and very brave in the past are, have been a little bit subdued. Uh, <laughs> Uh, now, after after what's happened, yeah. Um, so we had Natalia, Ben, and Ani and Adi, yeah. And uh, the right back okay. is that it, Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Natalia, Ben, and so. Uh, so uh, can you, uh, thanks a lot uh, for this story. And can you explain more? Because it's a, now the common knowledge that the Muslim Brotherhood is. Working together with the uh, military and a lot of people in Egypt, well, they are the same, there is no difference between them. How you stop, can explain how really this organism works? Is it like a big business involved, you know, maybe like to make it clear how these former enemies work together to crack down like people like you? And the other thing, like now, what would be your um, observation? Because like the last year in Egypt, I felt like then talking to the activists, I felt a lot of hostility between the former activists. This guy would tell, like, oh, she is not the one, she is standing with the Islamists. Another investigative reporter would talk about the blogger that, like, oh, this guy not anymore, like, good. You know, so there was well, really not that nice feeling. But, on the, uh, but that was a year ago. And now, when the situation is tightened, do you feel that the people get again to be united against the common enemy? <coughs> Thank, thank you for coming in and sharing your, your experience is really fascinating because you have really unique, you, you were inside, you were outside, you were working for government, you were working for international organization. Um, so one question is just what are you up to now? Um, that's the short one. And the, the longer one is, is that I spent much of 2011 between Washington and Egypt. And a lot of the questions that we've been asking here are what strategies should activists use under what conditions to, in order to resist. And I'm curious about the activism via institutions in Egypt versus outside of institutions. So um, I say that I draw that distinction because in the summer of 2011, there are a lot of foreigners saying, Elections are a zero-sum game, constitution zero-sum game, work with the liberals and go and influence, influence that process. And, oh, and, and many activists said, no, 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 it's all rigged. We get our power from being in the streets, outside of institutions, we need to stay here, and, and this, is, this is how we're going to, to, to affect. And so and I'm wondering, you mentioned, looking back for you, maybe you should have been more visible, it may have provided you more safety. And so I'm wondering, looking back for, for the activists, whether you think things might be different, how things might be different now if there was more activism through the electoral process and the constitution process. Uh, uh, should we take one more question and then we'll go on. Uh, Ami, will then we'll answer them. Um, actually, I have two questions. Uh, the first is about uh, external support. Uh, I would like to know your opinion um, about to what extent uh, the external support helped proceed and succeed the revolution. And uh, the second is about knocking effect of Tunisian revolution uh, uh, on uh, Egyptian one. Uh, I mean, uh, let's assume that uh, revolution um, uh, in Tunis will not, uh, had not occurred and with its positive result. 
and uh, in this case, uh, uh, might can we assume that uh, people in Egypt could might not uh, initiate a protest and move on from their places? Uh, otherwise, they were uh, despite they were fed up with the regime and uh, through all that here. So uh, I would like to know. Um, the knocking effect of the Tunisian one. So, okay, I tried to ask Okay, do you want to answer? Okay, maybe we'll start with the last question first, and um, and then I'll hand over to Matty to talk about uh, to respond to the time uh, Ben's question. Um, I think that uh, we have actually two very different contexts uh, here. I mean, um, I just came back from Tunisia last week, a couple of ten days ago, and uh, even there, there's quite a high level of frustrations. So, I mean, I think the problem is that after a revolution, like the revolution that we experience, the expectations are always so high. So that's the first thing. Expectations are so high, and even with a functioning, uh, uh, you know, well-functioning government, a well-functioning administration, which we don't have really up to this date in either country, it's still very hard to meet that level of expectation. I think that's that's the first thing. The second thing is that um, what you have in Tunisia is a very, very strong um, base of female activism. So the women, women had an extremely strong voice and for all the clampdowns, the previous um, uh, pre president before Ben Ali had been an avid promoter of women's rights and women's education. So you had like a kind of very strong base of um, female cadre that were there to kind of move into the administration and that are in effect playing a more active role in the administration. So that's already like separate architecture to what we have, uh, what we have uh, in Egypt. And I think now with the, um, what we're also seeing in Tunisia is we're seeing that um, States like uh, Saudi Arabia and other, uh, well, primarily Saudi Arabia is a kind of uh, exporting their brand of Islam, of uh, Salafi Islam, into Tunisia, which is um, threatening to actually sabotage some of the good work that has been going on there. So again, that's like a strain on on the Tunisian system. So I think there is a lot of uh, wait and see, very high expectation, but also a certain level of tension. Um, at the same time, what you have in Tunisia that you don't have in Egypt is that there has been a huge mushrooming and a certain amount of freedom for civil society organizations, like overnight, literally, I was there a few weeks after the revolution in um, February, March of 2011 in Tunisia, and uh, I, we held this workshop, and there was about 40 NGOs that had formed overnight in the last few weeks, in the first few weeks after the revolution, to say we want to fight corruption in Tunisia. And um, so there was a lot of uh, will, a lot of activity, although there were very few activists with real expertise, with real understanding, strategy, and tactics. But at least they had the freedom to start organizing and to start forming which is not, I think, a different scenario to the one we have in Egypt, right? Um, let me get to the question of the military first. Um, I think right now the military is in a very fortunate position. I mean, in the, not that they are, uh, in, they are themselves the, the good or the aim or the goal to, to happen, but they are in a very privileged position because when they were ruling the transition, they were the ones who are getting all the heat, they were the ones who are getting all the blame. Now, when Morsi came to power, everyone was just holding their breath. How is he going to just deal with, uh, with the military? And he surprised everyone with the move of like sweeping, like sacking of the heads of the, of the, of the military regime, uh, the military uh, uh, council, including Tantawi himself. But he gave them medals. And few months later, he made sure that the articles in the Constitution preserve their rights and protect them. So right now, under the Constitution, the military budget is exempt from parliamentary oversight. And they have the right to try civilians when in cases of threat to national security without defining what national security is. So they got out of the game, was like with a win-win situation. We are still like having, enjoying a lot of power, 
they are protected against accountability of the of the military, of the parliament and the the civil society, and they have the right to try civilians. So they are in a very good position now. And the, the the sad thing is that people in Egypt, or generally, I think this is a common thing, is like we have a very short memory. Is that when we saw when people saw the atrocities and, and the violations of human rights by the Muslim Brotherhood, people say it's like we want the oh, Egyptian military back back, and it's like. Did you forget that they are the ones that had the Maspero massacres? They, they they moved with tanks over the bodies of people. They stepped over a woman and strapped her naked in the middle of the higher square. And now they're calling you are calling them to save you from from that. And he's like this short memory of lack of of understanding the long term consequences of bringing back a military regime that took us 60 years to just at least <coughs> remove its head from from power. So that that's. That's the, the problem now. The relationship between the Brotherhood and the military regime, I, I see as a, as a pure interest and, and survival uh, relationship. I mean, like, if you, you let me do my thing, I let you do your thing, you have your protection article in the Constitution, no one will come near you, and we're not gonna interfere. But this, this situation may change very quickly on June 30th, where, uh, People in Egypt are, are, are planning mass protests if the numbers go to an extent that things go out of hand, then maybe the military will step in again. And I, I mean, like, it would be very arrogant of me to think that I can even predict what can happen then. But I'm sure that there is a wide, unfortunately, wide sector of the society would be calling for them to step in. And, and some people are talking about having a, a presidential council where we have one military man, one person, one secular, one Muslim Brotherhood or, or Islamist in the council. Or there is another strategy is to have to ask uh, the, the head of, by the constitution, the head of the constitutional court would rule for a temporary and give 60 days period to have, to have early presidential elections. All these are speculations. I mean, it's not going to be easy. And I, uh, unfortunately, everyone is armed now in Egypt. And this is something you know, people pretend that it's not there. Unfortunately, it is there. It's going to be violent. And the consequences of that, we don't know. Um, about the question about the, the, the rift between the activists themselves and the people who are like bashing each other, I think this is a normal feature. I and mean, like we're talking about like how wide sector of people also, and, and again, they're fighting over resources. They, and resources, I don't mean money, but recognition and position and power. And, but I think, I mean, like some of the actors that you're referring to have revised their positions. And I remember, like I'm, I'm very close to, for example, the uh, people, the leaders of April 6th movement. And I remember we had like almost arguments when they were saying it's like, we have to, Support Morsi, and it's like hey, I don't, I would not want to see the military regime coming back. But I mean, don't underestimate what the what this group is going to be. And they say they would say it's like, but they promised us they're going to be like leaders for all Egyptians. It's like yeah, okay, okay, good luck. And uh, and and actually, Ahmed Meher was the head of uh, the the April Six movement was in Washington. And we, we were talking about this, I mean, like last month, and he left me, went to the airport, and got arrested by Morsi. That he, he was the, 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 the one of the most passionate people supporting Morsi, and he, he was celebrating all over social media and the streets when he won. But then again, these regimes, I mean, like, they only know interest, and it's not in their interest to maintain such a vibrant, alert, movement like April 6 in the streets like watching and, and seeing what you're doing and it's, it's there in, in, in their interest to break them but why are they doing this so early on is because the regime is not able to deliver I mean if we were in a position that we were um, economically well off the regime could have been ha able to have more tolerance to what's going on but because they know that they can actually only sell words to people and they can, the other option is to crack down on, on dissent, then the only option for them is to become more authoritarian because they cannot bribe people into silence. This, this is why when people say Egypt is going to be Iran, I say it's not going to be Iran, not because the Brotherhood don't want it to be or they're more liberal, open-minded, it's that they cannot afford to be Iran. They don't have the main financial resources and tools and means to be, to be Iran. Um, we had Hardy. We had Hardy next. Um, Evgenia, Ayes, 
and Sivan uh, and uh, Mary. So, Hardy. Uh, thank you both of you for your presentation. Uh, Two-part question. The first is just about the role of the United States. Um, looking back over the last couple of years, what criticisms do you have or things you wish to be different? Um, the second part is, is a bit of a more abstract question. Um, so I'm interested in how we can track the way that political situations change over time. And the most obvious way is to look at who's in charge. Who's the president? That's the snapshot we get from the media. Of course, you know, if you only look at that, you don't predict something like what would happen in 2011, right? So the same journalists who say, or experts who say, a revolution will never happen, and you know, in 2011 now, will tell you, it, and it will never happen again, even though it did happen, you know, even though they were wrong last time. Right this time, I don't know. But that's what I hear most about, who's in charge. But the other indicators would be like, for example, you know, how are things at the grassroots of civil society? Maybe not even in the traditional sort of opposition organizations, but at the level of student unions, professional syndicates, that kind of thing. You know, or do they do they have to have a regime loyalist at their head now? Or they do they have some autonomy? Another way of looking at it would be, you know, looking at splits in the adversary, whether it's uh, the administration and their separation from the general population, or splits within the military, or among members of the Brotherhood, or you, know, you get the idea. And, and, and you know, that's another sort of more nuanced look. And then another way of tracking the conflict would be, of course, changes in the broader political culture, the kinds of conversations and consciousness people are having. So I'm not asking you to cover all of those in your answer, but I am interested in, in your thoughts on some of those and how, if, if particularly, frankly, if there are any sort of things that you see trending in, in what, what seems like an optimistic direction for you. Okay, thank you, Hardy. Then, um, uh, Yevgenia? Yeah. Thanks for your presentations. I became really sad while listening to you, and, you know, I feel sorry. Потому что в России мы очень следили за арабской весной в Египте. И наши события, они были во многом, ну, мы, ну, мы провели свои вот эти демонстрации за честные выборы, потому что вы нас очень вдохновили. And all, and we had demonstrations for the, um, you know, a just uh, justice uh, in the elections for for the fair elections. We were inspired by you guys, you know. And now listening, you know, about the outcome, it makes me, you know, even cry, almost cry. И uh, у себя в России мы постоянно говорили, но если египтяне могут, то значит и мы можем. А теперь вы говорите, что получается у вас устанавливается военная диктатура. And now it looks like from your presentation that you're, you know, going into the directions of the military dictatorship. И uh, у меня вопрос, как же так получилось, что диктатура Мубарака сменилась на военную диктатуру? So Почему это произошло? И как нам, вот, чтобы могли бы посоветовать, как what нам избежать этих ошибок? Чтобы не повторить вот это вот Well, my question is actually really relates to Hardy's second question. So, what are you doing right now? I mean, how do you reach the public? Um, are you working with different organizations, uh, not only in other NGOs, but with other civil organizations? Um, that's it, basically. Mary. Nancy, can I throw back at you what Peter Ackerman said, in particular reference to the June 30 protests that you mentioned? He said, there's no point in having a nonviolent action without a strategy. And he said, if you don't plan, you lose. 
can you talk about the June, what's happening on June 30 in that context? Sure. Is there a strategy? Is there a plan? Okay. So I think I think all the questions are related to each other. So I'm I'm, I'm going to just reflect on them. But I want to take one question first about the role of the U.S. web and what can be done. And then after that, what is going on now in in, in the streets of Cairo, where things are happening to some groups and others are not, and also the student community. The role of the U.S. I think the U.S. has been wrong again or even if to put it mildly late again, always delayed in their, and, and mild and timid in their responses. And I, I, I just want to take you back to the words of uh, Maria yesterday when she was talking about how like the, the, the response of transferring money takes time and it's a bureaucracy and everything, but not everything is, 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 is responded to or the solution is money. I mean, sometimes as a, a, a political statement goes a long way. But, for example, when people were killed in front of the Tahrir Palace in Egypt because they're trying to stop shoving a constitution down the throats of, of Egyptians in 15 days, and the statements coming, statement coming from the State Department saying the U.S. is concerned, yeah. I mean, that is that is a slap on the face of the people who believed when Obama came out and said, like, we're going to stay by the Egyptians and people. And this feeds into the perception, I know this is not true, but it feeds into the, per the perception that the, uh, that the Americans are conspiring to support the brotherhood in the region and the, and the Islamists. And, and so many people that you talk to in Egypt believe this. I mean, but they believe it because they didn't see any action that contradicts that. They didn't see a strong statement when something like that happens. When we were raided, again, I mean, like, it, not when we were raided, but we, when the sentence came out, yeah, uh, last week, again, the statement came out, it was like, the U.S. is concerned. I mean, like, no, when 43 people get convicted with maximum sentence, you don't get concerned. Germany had a, a, a statement saying the German government is outraged. And these, I mean, like, it's not a matter of rhetoric or words. The, these governments care so much about their image. That's why they're lying all the time. That's why they're having this double speak. And, and, and the, li the more they lie, the more I feel optimistic because they are afraid. They care. At least they care about their image. And because we know they care, we try to name and shame every act that violates the human rights and democracy in the country. And that's very important. So that's one small thing that can be done. And it's not like if the statement is strong enough, the next day the, the Morsi is going to go and bomb Israel. It's not going to happen like that. <laughs> and it's, I mean, like, they, but they keep on playing that game all the time. The other mistake is that when the U.S. waived or, or, or used the card of the, the, the military aid, but never used it. Yeah. And that is like, the Egyptians called their bluff, basically. Yes. I mean, it's like, it's just, you cannot, I mean, you either use it or not use it, but if you're not gonna use it, don't talk about it, because it loses its leverage as a, as a, as a tool. And uh, so, so that's, that's one thing, like speaking out on human rights and democracy issues, because this resonates with a whole generation growing up thinking that the U.S. only cares about the security and the safety and the interest, but they don't care less about human rights and democracy. And this is the generation that they're going to carry on, and they're going to be the leaders later on, and they're going to be the people that the U.S. is going to deal with later on. So I think that's very important. And it's not the answer is not just resources and funding and foreign funding. It was also diplomatic and and even behind door diplomacy. I mean, it's, it's just uh, another thing that's important. Um, and the other thing about the unions, actually, the student unions and the syndicates, the, the popular reflected the, how the popularity of the Brotherhood dipped down in just less less than a year. I mean, seventy percent of the of the unions and the syndicates were won by seculars in across the board, all over, and that was like an, an amazing victory. To an extent that some people thought that it is a conspiracy from the brotherhoods to show people, to, to make them think, to trick them into thinking that they're going to win, to take them to, to the parliament and then they're going to win. It's like people were on, I mean, couldn't believe that like 70% with unions that have been for long, even under the Mubarak regime, dominated by the brotherhood. I mean, like, it was a great victory. Uh, as for the activists and the way they work, whether they work within in the institutes or, out, or outside, 
I think both are important. Institutionalized democracy is important, and it's important to establish that. But as we are still, things are still moving. One of the issues and one of the problems in Egypt is that under Mubarak, no one could work at least openly in politics. So you either work as a rights and democracy activist, but not anything that is labeled political. And then after, so everyone was like removed from this scene. After the revolution, there was this vacuum because of the lack of experience and lack of practice. So technically, every single person who's a leader in the activist scene in Egypt was a human rights and democracy person. And they're not the same. You cannot be a human rights and a politician at the same time. And you cannot, and it, and it hurts both causes. Because, I mean, like, if you're stubborn, like, for example, there are a group of leftists in Egypt, I respect them very much, I love them, I love their ideals, but they don't have this thing about the, the, the political game, how to, how to strike deals, how to compromise, how to get the other person on your side. They're very idealistic, they ostracize everyone who disagrees with them, and they alienate everyone. I mean, like, which is fine if they are human rights activists or human rights uh, workers, because, I mean, this is a principle that cannot be com compromised. But you can do this and call yourself a politician at the same time and try to play that game, because you're going to lose. That, that, that's uh, one of the things. And June 30th, or for June 30th, is this off record? <laughs> well, I know that there is at least a plan. And there is a your sentence, don't worry. <laughs> thank you for that. I'll say thank you so much. <laughs> well, I, I, my understanding is a little bit better. I think some of the people, there is a le there is leadership there. Whether it's going to succeed or not, again, it's it's out there. But I, I understand for, from, from people on the ground that there is a strategy, there is a plan. Whether it's a good plan or a bad plan, I, I, I don't know. Whether it involves the involvement of the military, that is a sc very scary thing for me. And But some people see that this is the only way, I mean, like, this is the only like strong uh, pillar that is left in, in the country. But uh, not everyone is engaged in, in what you see as a, as a strategy and a, a long-term plan. But there are people who at least have a vision that's better than the, the 25th of Jan time. There, there is a lesson there that is learned, but I'm not sure if it's the right lesson. Okay. Regarding the model, okay, just the comment. Isn't the whole purpose of tomorrow like it defeats the purpose because Morsi was democratically elected? So they're coming up and asking that basically that there's a show of no confidence by the public in him less than a year into his presidency. And they're just saying that, you know, we messed up, the system doesn't work. Well, when, people, when people say something like that, it, it makes it look like the only problem with Mubarak is that he was not democratically elected. <laughs> so no, 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 no. I mean that that would I mean yes he was democratically elected but he did not abide by the rules of the institutions that that got him into his seat I mean like he 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 made a constitutional declaration that puts him above the law and above the judges he violated the human rights and the and democracy rules I mean he's not. He's I'm not playing with the rules well, of democracy. Well, I speak to Egyptians on the, on the streets of Egypt. They're all like, how many times have we fine? He's not doing it. Well, he's violating everything. He's fine. He's holding on to Are we going to keep on doing this every time someone doesn't stick to the promises? I mean, if you look at any president in any country, they, they never stick that's to the promises true. they give. But, but I have three things to say about that. First of all, Tamarut, I don't look at it, just for you, for, for those of you who don't know Tamarut, Tamarut is a, is a movement that started by people going around with uh, a, 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 an application where you fill it in and say that you rebel against the rule of, uh, of, of Morsi. Right now, they say they have something between 17 million signatures and things like that. I think, of course, the numbers are not that big. But Tamarut is more of a symbolic movement. It's not real, and it, it will not have, like, they cannot take these people and go, uh, papers and go to court and have a real uh, a case to bring Morsi down. It is more symbolic of showing, is like, people can actually rebel against you when you don't perform as we expected to, to elect you. So that's the one, the first thing I say about, um, about tomorrow. And the second, the second thing, yeah, there's a, I'll, leave, I'll leave it to Arwa after that, is that the, the second thing is that, 
will we keep on doing this? And the answer is yes. I mean, like, the revolution continues, the revolution stays for years and years. I think it was too early in Egypt when people wanted to rush just a few months after the revolution to go into parliamentary elections. No one was ready for that. People were not organized and everything. And so, this, is, this, yes, is this, this is the essence. This is the essence. So, um, yeah, I think uh, also I'll try to take from my perspective then um, as, as much of the, uh, of the questions. Um, I think when Yevgeny, I'll take Yevgeny's question about what happens so that Mubarak's dictatorship becomes another dictatorship. I mean, this is the $60 million question, but I think from perhaps a tactical perspective and from those of us that were very closely observing it, I think that activists and these civil society movements, they let up the pressure too early, much too early. And I think um, because we had such an unprecedented result with the deposement of Mubarak, because if you talk to these movements, um, they'll say to you they never, their aim wasn't initially to depose Mubarak, it was a, something that gathered momentum, it assumed a life of its own, then they saw what they were capable of, they actually started to realize their own power. And then I think there was no preparation, like you said, there was no preparation for the time after Mubarak. And in the very early days, we saw some of these key young people that had been at the, the vanguards of many of these movements in a very uh, sort of comfortable, cushy discussions with the military council, where observers were getting very worried and were saying, look, there's a danger, these people are being bought out uh, already. So there was a worry that they were not maintaining their stance and perhaps, uh, you know, overwhelmed by this euphoria of having brought down Mubarak, that activists had not kept up their pressure. I think that's... Um, that's one, uh, one uh, point. Um, the other thing that I would say about the Muslim Brotherhood, not just about the Muslim Brotherhood, but I think it also apply to other parties, the Muslim Brotherhood had for a long time been a party that was underground. It was an opposition, but it was underground. It's, it's one thing to be in opposition and to be an, an underground party. It's been pushed underground. It's another thing to be a party in government. And these are two completely different things regardless of what anybody might think about the Muslim Brotherhood, they're not a party uh, of government, they have no practice of the real day-to-day -day business of running an, an administration. And um, I think what they failed to realize is some very basic real politique issues about how um, they need to build alliances with others in order to sort of move the basic day-to-day -day business of government along. And I think to come back to the issue of Maybe we wouldn't have even had the Muslim Brotherhood in power if we had had all these other parties and all these other groups that had organized ahead of the elections, if they'd been able to come together a bit more and form uh, actual real functioning coalitions. Like we had groups, um, parties made up of some of the young, you know, young uh, people that were aspiring to have political careers like um, Athola Mustamira, you know, the revolution continues, and so many other parties that were basically clean, okay, there were people that didn't have that much experience, but they were clean, there were people that were new, they were fresh, they were not part of the old regime. And I think the problem is, my personal analysis is that if all these groups had come together, the Independent Party, the Revolution Continues Party, if all of these groups had joined in one coalition, instead of dispersing and spreading the votes like that, then I think it would have been possible to outdo the Brotherhood. Do you agree, uh, Nancy? Yeah, I mean, I, for, for me, really, from my observation, I've been working with civil society groups um, now for more than, in the Arab world for more than 15 years. To me, this is really the heart of the challenge of our work, is that people are often so concerned with, them, with being the one to get the credit, rather than perhaps subordinating my position for the common agenda, for the common good. And I think this is really at the heart of one of the problems. Do you just want to say something? No, just just to like continue. I mean, like on Dalia's thing, and all the people who say, "Are we going to keep on doing this?" And, and I think it's like all people who are used to being confusing stability with stagnation. And if people want change, I mean, like I think they they are they should and understand that there is a cost to pay. And if you're just sitting there and not willing to pay the cost, I mean, like for, for in in my personal case, I mean, I had. 
Uh, I, I had a very prestigious job in, in the UK with a PhD and working for, for the UK government. I left, I went back to Egypt, I got caged, I got uh, tried, I got divorced, I'm a single mom with, two, with twins, I'm in exile, I cannot see my, my country or my mom again. She had a heart attack before my, one of my court trials. And just that does not make me regret one day that this is something I believe in because I mean like I live my life thinking it's like oh I cannot accept the injustice in Egypt but oh I'm gonna sit there and watch TV and wish it to go oh, away. <laughs> you know uh, I think uh, you said that you know, when you decided to go to work in the government in order to reform it uh, from inside you said that you know oh, you are happy that you didn't laugh. But don't, don't you think that that was actually a better decision? Because you know, in the Iranian Revolution, in the Iranian Revolution, 1979, before the revolution, all the people they knew that what they want, Shah should go. And after the, revo the revolution, again, something like this happened. Just everyone was, you know, looking for something different. And you know, the idea of con continuous revolution is a Marxist idea. And it's, it's not a realistic one. You are ready to, pay, you know, to do that, but majority of people are not doing that. And it doesn't work, in fact. You know, this is what I think that probably reforming is better than overthrowing something. But the majority of people cannot afford to stay in poverty until someday reform will happen. But, I mean, but it's just it, the it, same reform, yeah, I agree, mean, but revolution doesn't solve the po problem of poverty. Just right. yes. have a couple more questions. Um, I just wanted to respond quickly to Hardy's question, and then uh, Mario had got something he wanted to ask. Um, yeah, Hardy raised a lot of very, a very uh, valuable points. I mean, your question about how are things at the grassroots of civil society, I think what this serves to do, and it does very effectively, um, what we've heard, uh, Nancy's story, is that it serves to intimidate um, other groups who think then three times uh, before they publish a plan of action or before they even issue a press release or whatever. So this has had like impacts um, on others. I think that definitely there is some kind of, even if it's subliminal differentiation between civil society groups that are not working on the international level. There are a lot of them, you know, working to empower women in poor areas of Cairo and and these things that are not perceived as politically threatening. These things are probably allowed to operate and are receiving funds, and, you know, but the thing is, as, as um, the NGO movement is growing and people are becoming more interconnected, it's, going, it's only a matter of time before these people also face, um, face uh, you know, similar challenges. The moment that they decide, because you see, even under Law 84, there's a clause in Law 84 where um, it, it could be if they, cho if they chose to actually implement it, even exchanging information from a foreign organization can be a criminal offense. So exchanging information can be, yeah, it can be interpreted as, you know, e even email. They could even emailing people, you know, in the West could be interpreted as exchanging information. So it's a minefield, an absolute minefield. Um, and this is why people hate this law, this law 84 um, so much. When you talk to, I think, generally about the role of the US and things that have been different, well, it's like saying, you know, ideal world, what's your, what's your wish for an ideal world? But I think, really, the Egyptian um, the situation had been captive for a long time purely because of the huge sums of money in of aid that Egypt receives. I mean, for those who don't know, Egypt is the second biggest recipient of US aid, um, second only to Israel. So, you know, I mean, that, again, you know, of course you're going to be in a position where you owe, right? And I think as long as that situation remains, it's going to be very, very difficult. Um, you know, uh, all these allegiances and all these things that come into play. Yeah. Um, Mario. If the current government in some ways is even more oppressive than the Mubarak regime, and things are not going well economically either, so in other words, if there's a lot of pressure on society, why is it even harder to mobilize people into resistance now? Can you, can you say that? Yes, we just repeat Mario's question. Mario's question was, um, why is it harder to mobilize people to resistance and if things seem more oppressive now than they were in the past? And then can Eric, can Eric, Eric respond to that? Yeah. Okay, Erica, go, go um, ahead. So I just forwarded Mary this article that's called People Power or One Shot Deal. And what it's about is saying that when people do have some kind of mass mobilization, and it installs somebody who's as bad or worse than the predecessor, then it's actually harder to get them to do it again. Um, and it's because it's very risky, and they 
have had the experience of putting their necks out there, but uh, they didn't get the result they wanted, and they don't necessi necessarily see a clear field of alternative candidates that might be better. And so what this suggests is that nonviolent campaigns, you know, the sort of constructive program aspect of, of nonviolent campaigns can be crucial in leading to the more democratic outcome. Because, you know, a lot of people have mentioned this over the course of the week that having an alternative of vision of what the campaign actually wants and kind of, you know, not a personality per se, but a group of people from whom they know that they might have a better alternative is kind of crucial. So I think that's why these kind of really short campaigns that don't really have time to kind of do the promotion of a, a candidate that has broad representation among the campaign, why they often end up being one-shot deals. And that it, it takes years and years for people to sort of start to scan the environment for a viable alternative and be willing to take that kind of risk again. And, and it, it means that the, the sort of preceding action is super important to sort of visualize what the candidate's going to look like in the long run, but then also the, the first two years or so after uh, the success are absolutely critical in making sure that there is an opposition that unifies around a candidate that has very broad-based legitimacy and it has democratic values, essentially. Я хотела дополнить Эрику, потому что у нас есть исторические периоды очень яркие. Это Россия, когда у нас Октябрьская революция завершилась жесточайшими репрессиями. И люди просто не смогли этому противостоять. Вот мне бы очень хотелось, чтобы в Египте было так же. Uh, example of the Russian Revolution of 1917, which was initially a democratic revolution and it uh, ended with very bloody terror. And I don't want to see Egypt in the same position. And that reminds me that I didn't answer your question about like, like looking at Russia and, and the inspiration of, of, the, of the Arab Spring and a lot of people look at Egypt and Tunisia and want to copy them. But it's actually true for dictators. I mean, dictators copy from each other. And uh, I think after our raids, I mean, like the UAE shut down a several organizations and then recently Russia kicked out USAID from, uh, from there. I mean, like, and, and it carries on. But the good news is that dictators uh, are plagiarizers. I mean, they copy each other by the book. I mean, they use the same playbook. But activists are very creative and very innovative. And they are not as predictable as, as, as their uh, oppressors. And the other good news is that, I, I think I agree with Erica, but the, and I agree with you as well, I mean, like with the historical context of, of Russia. But there are two things. First of all, um, People reached a point in Egypt where they don't have much to lose. I mean, they are like, they're losing their jobs. The person who goes to the streets, if he doesn't, he knows he's going to continue the rest of his life unemployed. I mean, like, he's 25 years, has no job, has nothing to lose. Why would he go back and sit home? I mean, he'd rather go there and just have a struggle and feel even this, this self-esteem that he's made creating change and doing this. That's why I don't think it's difficult to mobilize. As for Russia, I think... What I count on is that the dynamics are different. Like we have tools and, and things that brings the, the word out that we're not there. Like we didn't have the Twitter and the internet and, and things that mobilize people and have the international solidarity there that maybe this would not bring everything back to the status quo as it used to be in the past. And that's what I count on. Yeah, I think, I'm not sure how much more time we have. Darren? Yeah, you have time for maybe one more question or comment, so one or two minutes. Okay, then, that's not much time. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Can I make a quick announcement in terms of where the next rooms are? Um, so the next round we have Struggle in Africa. That's going to be in schmidt Heine Lecture Hall. The second option is Civil Resistance and Corporate Action, which will be in this room. And the third is the Arts of Resistance, which will be in room 231. Okay, thank you, Darren. Um, is there somebody who hasn't asked a question, or had like a real burning issue, they want to get off their chest, they would feel really unhappy, <laughs> really unhappy if they left this room without having asked the question, that question? 
somebody was up from up, up here in this corner, I couldn't see had their hand up. Or is that question been resolved? It, it was me, but it's a kind of a long, probably. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, yes, please. If I can just ask it, but you can answer it maybe while we're walking. But it's something that I'm thinking about from this conversation. It's the more general um, issue of identity that people can draw upon when they are, you know, in opposition to. Uh, the uh, uh, autocratic ruler. And in the U.S., the, the Constitution, for, for better or worse, is still kind of considered a common text, a reference point for measuring, you know, how, a, a, a rallying point even, to, still to some degree. Poverty seems, to fight against poverty, is a kind of identity, you know, to say that we're, our backs are against the wall, mm -hmm. we, we, we have to push back. But is it, it's not, a, it's a negative, you know, identity. It's not the positive where you can say, here's our text, yeah. you know, here is who we are as a people. So I'm not a nationalist, but this, this what is the text for Egypt? Or the, I, the, the here we are all together on this, well, I think the text for Egypt is not just poverty. Actually, you to King Lear as one of the causes. Mm -hmm. I think if I would characterize the, the uprising in Egypt, it is a rev generational revolution. And it's a, it's a revolution against all forms of oppression. Patriarchal oppression, religious oppression, uh, authoritative oppression, I mean, like all forms of authority. And I think it's like one of the things that was so refreshing in Egypt is like to see at the time of the voting or the time of the voting to include you see five a family of five people, each one of them is voting for a different candidate. And that would not have happened before. And that is like seeing the younger generation thinking they know better. And I think there are several we can talk about this later, I mean like the several factors that led to that and what are the, the, the main drivers and factors that led to this kind of change of the structural barriers to change. I totally to agree, and I think um, my, the last thing I would say is I think that people's will for change is, str is stronger than their fear of any repercussions. So people's will for change, people's will to not put up with that, people's um, level of uh, outrage and of dissatisfaction is much higher than their fear of what may follow. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.